Why did I go on so long about this? I can't tell you how important it is to identify a mass base to move a movement. And that mass base is not small, or it wouldn't be a mass base. And when they finally realized that the time to march in the square was now, these are all pictures of when we were up there, because protest is a regular thing now. They found that they had a base that couldn't be impacted in the same way because the government wasn't delivering. It's a lesson for all of us, really. The, uh, where are we now? Um, it's important that as, as one of the legacies of that activity more than a year and a half ago, even in the disappointment that many of the activists have in where the revolution stands today, as some of you may know, and you may have talked about this morning within the last week, the runoff candidates were announced. It was someone who was a candidate put forward by the Muslim Brotherhood. It was someone who had been a Mubarak uh, you know, functionary in the last government, so you couldn't have a clear, more distributed choice. And for many of the younger organizers and progressives, their candidates ended up in a you know, first to the post kind of race, not in the runoff. But it's also, uh, there was a, a, an important point made recently that one of the things that was true is that they would always still control the square. So in the legacy of the movement, they're still feeling whatever happens in the election, as long as we can get into the square, we still have a chance of affecting change. I think that's a lesson from the movement and a lesson about social change that's also very important. I don't want to be Pollyanna if so. As soon as this revolution happened, this is true in all movements for social change, there's almost as powerful an effort to co-opt it. So if you look at this slide, this was put up by the Egyptian Tourism Bureau, and when we were there uh, last fall, it was everywhere. Here's a fist, the sign of the you know, revolution with sunglasses because it support Egypt's tourism. So already the, the symbols and uh, the new uh, signpost of, of change are being subsumed into those who would argue that the change needs to be the way they want it to be, which may not be much change at all. Uh, there's a little bit of art and culture you see around. This is, uh, uh, I couldn't resist this image. This is part of what movements do give is voice. You can see, I don't know how good the picture is, but words finally coming out of a mummy. How powerful an Egyptian image is that? Words, I mean, it's not a horror movie. It's like, you know, inspiring. I'm with you. <laughs> and in terms of how movements are absorbed, you know, People in Egypt aren't that much different from us. You could go to a rally, there'd be 50,000 people here, and you'd still, you know, you could still get something to drink, you could, you know, get more to eat than it turns out you can get in Springfield College. You know, they were selling the local delicacies there. You know, what can I say? If I'd known where I was going, I would have brought my coffee cart up here. Um, the Occupy movement uh, is certainly not the Arab Spring. And it's not fair to Occupy Wall Street or, or what we hope to even really compare the two. Arab Spring in every sense is a real movement going after, you know, huge uh, entrenched uh, governments and oppression. People are paying with their lives for what that movement means. Um, in many ways, in our lifetimes, you could only compare some parts of the uh, civil rights movement in the South with what we've seen in the Arab Spring. The Occupy movement, though, is important and it has had real resonance. Uh, so it speaks to something that, as students of social change as you are, that it's important for you to understand. Um, first thing to understand is this is not a made in America movement. I hope I'm not the first one to tell you this. But the roots of the Occupy movement, and particularly some of the defining techniques methodology and tactics almost solely come from Spain. Anybody from Spain? Thank you anyway. <laughs> and the things that came from places like Spain included the, the huge commitment to consensus, the practice of what's called a general assembly. Has anybody ever been to an Occupy event or meeting? Well, three or four of us. Um, so take my word from this, uh, it comes from Spain. 
But those kinds of things, for any of you who have seen them, uh, that's, those are manuals and playbooks that are elaborately written uh, in Spain. The actual encampment tactic owes more to Mexico. Um, any of you ever been to Mexico? Okay, more people have been to Mexico than an Occupy meeting, so it helps me get a sense of who I'm listening to. That's, but if you've ever been to Mexico, in Zocalo, or in almost any city, the tactic of a, a plantone, as it's called, an encampment of people with a protest about an issue. For years, you could go around Zacatecas and other places, and teachers who were being you know, thrown out of their jobs were camping, sometimes, as I say, for months and months and years uh, to make public their protest in a very silent but dramatic way until some change was won. So uh, it was interesting. I picked up this picture from Seattle. It was interesting to see that this tactic was actually recognized there, but it is a tactic that came not from the U.S., but from places like Mexico, where they're really uh, much better at uh, dealing with it. Um, some of what I think actually are the enduring contributions of the Occupy movement, and it's not just their sort of 99 to 1 slogans, but I actually think this commitment to deep democracy and consensus as aggravating and as uh, frustrating as it is for most professional organizers like myself. I mean, a meeting that normally you would think could happen in an hour could take eight hours or six hours. I mean, it was like watching paint dry. Everybody got to say, and they had this way of doing with hand signals, which was sort of crazy. You know, if you like something, you know, you, I forget how you, how did you do it? Uh, like this or something? Yeah, like this. So, you know, if you were saying, oh, I really like that guy Wade, what he's saying, if we were in a, an Occupy meeting, what would you be doing? And I'd be waving back to you, my God. Gotcha. Okay, uh, like I say, I'm not a natural Occupy hand signal guy. I admit. But I do think what they were trying to do is worth all of us who care about social change really thinking about, because what they're trying to do is, in fact, a challenge and failure for most organizational methodologies today. Because what they're trying to do is get full engagement and participation of people who show them up there. And all of you have been to a meeting about some kind of issue, some kind of campaign, some kind of action before, have you not? Sometime, about something. And how many times have you then taken the next step and gotten more active, or in fact taken a step backwards and said, well, I couldn't really figure out what to say, when to say it, they didn't really want me, maybe I'm not the organizer, and ended up withdrawing from that action as opposed to committing. Has that never happened to anybody here? Yes. Yeah. The rest of you are liars. <laughs> because it does happen. It happens all the time in organizational activities. I've been doing this for more than 40 years, and I can see it in meetings I've organized on people's face. Who's engaging, who's not engaging, who's coming in, who's withdrawing. And part of what the Occupy thing tried to do, and it's an important contribution, something we learn, need to learn of, whether it's all these signals or not, is Try to deeply engage everybody who's there. And to say that you're not going to move forward until everybody is part of that engagement, that agreement, that consensus. I actually think uh, in organizing, for those of you in human services and elsewhere, long after we can't remember what in the world Occupy was trying to do, and we don't care if it had leaders or not leaders, you'll be thinking about this deep engagement methodology and how to bring it to your work. The other thing that was very clear about the Occupy thing is that it met a desperate, unarticulated need for a movement. I could be in Palermo in uh, Italy where uh, Acorn in Italy is working. And here's uh, where the Occupy people were. You see the sign, Eat the Rich must have been a slogan over there. I don't even <laughs> know if they knew what it meant in English. but. Uh, Occupy Mexico, it was in San Miguel de Ende, you know, there are Occupy signs still around, you can still see it. This is uh, obviously Mexico City, uh, Occupy was big there. Uh, Toronto, it's fascinating, you know, how it attracted, uh, particularly in Canada, labor union support, and in some cities in the United States, labor unions definitely uh, came to the fore. Uh, Acorn Canada participated in the uh, Occupy thing. 
Here's uh, some of our leaders up there speaking at a uh, general assembly. The other thing is, I, I think, Occupy Little Rock. This is a rainy day up there. They were all sort of huddled in a tent. Uh, Little Rock's a city a little bit bigger than Springfield. I don't think there was much of an Occupy thing in Springfield, was there? Boston. Well, Boston is Boston. It's, uh, in the sense that I've already spoken of the urge to co-op, Little Rock was sort of interesting. Uh, up until about a week ago, they still had an encampment because essentially the police chief made a deal with them if they were willing to move away from the center of town over to the city-owned property near the expressway, they could pretty much stay until they couldn't make it anymore. So they whittled them down to, you know, a dozen hardy souls. They were camped along. This is Easter. Uh, so they were there. Uh, I think, you know, secretly they were probably glad to finally be evicted uh, a couple of weeks ago. But this is sort of how movements are handled. I can remember one of the first times we sat in on a mayor's office in, in the United States many years ago in Acorn, and all of a sudden, instead of calling the police, which is what you expected, what you train people for, what the leaders are ready for, he, called, he walked out of his office, had his secretary sent in cokes and, cokes and cookies. Next thing you know, it was 7, 8 o'clock at night. We were still there by ourselves. They went in, what are you going to do? Eventually, you just leave. <laughs> but it's not like you felt like, I mean, you didn't have a target. You didn't get the job done. Uh, we hosted some meetings in New Orleans at, uh, at a coffee house there to get them out of the weather for a change. Where was Occupy similar to Arab Spring? It definitely is similar in the sense that it helped unite people who were disaffected. It did deal a lot with young people. It dealt with people who have issues around the economy, have not found a voice around the inequity that is now defining the United States. You don't ever want to look at these charts that look at the last 30 years and how we've gone from one of the more equitable countries to one of the the more inequitable countries in the world, the United States, thanks to tax policy and to the aggregation of wealth by the elites in this country. So all that was very similar to what you see in the Arab Spring, the feeling that there's a ceiling, that people are you know, drowning in school debt, they're being foreclosed in their houses. But what didn't happen there is you didn't have legitimate a uh, legitimate merging of the movements of labor and others to build a mass movement. Occupy, whether we like to say this or not, was, became an elite movement protesting against elite conditions. It ended up being those who could survive an encampment. It was essentially a tactic that devoured a strategy, a tactic that in fact almost has devoured the movement. 